from today onwards we shall start discussing the process technology as you find that uh, this is very important for any kind of material processing be it pn junction or uh, any kind of device and uh, it may be mentioned here that if we talk about the pn junction you see that uh, it is used extensively in uh, rectification switching and other operations in electronic circuits and uh, this pn junction is the key building block for bipolar transistor thyristor metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors that means MOSFET and even with proper biasing it can be used as microwave device and on exposed to light it can be used as a photonic device. Now uh, for this process technology you know that if we talk about this p n junction uh, one important aspect of this p n junction is the uh, oxidation as you find that there are many steps for the process technology one is oxidation on which we shall concentrate today others are the lithography ion implantation metallization and in our earlier discussion we have uh, uh, talked about the ion implantation in details and today's pn junction is nothing but uh, the fabrication by planar technology and this is the backbone of all ic technology then if you find that uh, for the formation of a pn junction you see that if we start from an n type silicon wafer first is uh, to grow a layer of silicon dioxide on it so, this is the first step which defines the p n junction. So, uh, oxidation is very important step for this processing and if you take another example of the MOSFET you will find that this uh, in MOSFET there are many kinds of dielectric polysilicon and uh, oxide films like this gate oxide, polysilicon gate, field oxide, dielectric li like silicon nitride then uh, SiO2. Now, there are many types of uh, thin frames which are used for the processing of MOSFET and important uh, of those are the dielectrics like SiO2 etc. Now, if we uh, subdivide into a large number of uh, in, into uh, if we subdivide the process technology related to MOSFET we will find that there are four types of uh, processing that need to be made one is the thermal oxidation another is the dielectric layer third one is the polycrystalline silicon and fourth one is the metal flame. You see that this is the metal flame like this is the aluminum this black region this black region are the aluminum. Then uh, polysilicon grate is the bluish region and one is the gate oxide another is the field oxide. Now if we start from the thermal oxide in MOSFET we will find that this is basically uh, a conducting channel uh, under which a conducting channel can be formed between source and drain you see that this is the source and this is the drain and this dielectric SiO2 under this the conducting channel is formed. Now this uh, gate oxide uh, is the is nothing but a, uh, the SiO2 then field oxide is another oxide which provides isolation from other devices like you see that in this case this is the field oxide which isolates this MOSFET from the other devices that means there may be another MOSFET here which is grown by planar technology and this SiO, SiO2 isolates that one. So uh, we find that this gate oxide field oxide which are important oxides for the fabrication of MOSFET and uh, thermal oxide oxidation provides highest quality oxides with lowest interface trap states. Now what is interface trap states you see that uh, if we talk about a silicon wafer then this is there is a discontinuity of the crystals because of the uh, cutting or a slice of the crystals have been taken out as a wafer and when we start from the silicon wafer there are unsaturated dangling bonds. there are unsaturated dangling bonds which are there at the surface because of the discontinuity of the crystalline state. Now this discontinuity of the crystalline state is uh, originated from the cutting of the crystal from the whole wafer from the whole crystalline uh, whole uh, bulk crystal say this is a bulk crystal and we take a piece of it we slice of it. So there is a discontinuity and it is very easy from the quantum mechanical treatment to establish that this discontinuity in the uh, crystalline states gives rise to 
the interface states that means between the conduction band and valence band we will find a large number of states which are known as the interface states and the origin of this interface state is the unsaturated covalent bonds due to the cutting of an a slice of the wafer from the original bulk crystal. Now, this thermal oxidation as we see that it provides a highest quality oxides with lowest interface trap states. Now, so we, we can assume that this <coughs> oxidation is very important step so far as the silicon uh, planar technology is concerned. Now, this uh, uh, another important aspect of this technology is you see that uh, this is a dielectric layer which we can uh, use for different types of uh, application like the insulation between conducting layers for di diffusion and ion implantation mask for capping doped films to prevent the loss of dopants and for passivation to protect devices from impurities, moisture and scratches. So, th these are the application of the dielectric layer and you can find that this is the dielectric layer, uh, this is silicon nitride which is used and uh, other types of dielectrics are also used like TiO2 that is a transparent conducting oxide and then ZNO which is another transparent conducting oxide and this type of conducting oxides is used particularly for the fabrication of the uh, optoelectronic device like TiO2 and SiO2. Uh, TiO2 is uh, a transparent oxide, conducting oxide, ZNO is another transparent oxide and those are used for the fabrication of the optoelectronic device, uh, solar cells, etcetera, the anti-reflection coating. So, that means you see that this dielectric layer is another important uh, layer which can be uh, fabricated using this process technology. Third one is the polycrystalline silicon, you see that in polycrystalline silicon it which is referred to as the polysilicon uh, in general and this is used as a gate electrode material in most devices, a conductive material for multi-level metallization and a contact material for devices with swallow junctions. So, this is another important uh, process technology with, with which we shall deal. You see that this is the polysilicon gate and uh, this is another polysilicon gate, this is another polysilicon gate. So, this is the contact layer and these are, are one of the important process technology which we shall deal with. And the last one is the metal film and in metal film it is used to form low resistance interconnections, ohmic contacts and rectifying metal semiconductor contacts. And aluminum is widely used for in silicon technology and uh, there are are a lot of research on aluminum and also the silicides like your iron silicides or, or, or titanium silicide or, sil or aluminum silicide, a large number of silicide is also used for the metal film. So, uh, from our discussion it is uh, apparent that the oxidation is very important uh, process technology and uh, you see that uh, the high quality native oxide on silicon and the term is very important here is the native oxide which is not a which is not available except for the silicon in whole semiconductor family. Sub, suppose let it if we talk about the gallium arsenide or say indium phosphide or zinc telluride, cadmium telluride, a large number of materials consisting of the semiconductor family and you see that this high quality native oxides are uh, not available uh, other than silicon and it acts as insulator as a barrier to diffusion and ion implantation. In P n junction it defines the junction area etcetera, these are the application of the oxidation and the oxidation can be dry and wet and uh, depending on which kind of oxygen I shall use, if for the fabrication of the oxidation I use. Uh, dry oxygen, I use dry oxygen, then it is known as the dry oxidation and if we use the high purity water vapor for the oxidation processing, then it is known as the wet oxidation, it is water vapor. So, for dry oxidation, dry oxygen is used and for the wet oxidation, water vapor is used, obviously both the uh, oxidizing species must be pure 
And you see that uh, other important properties of SiO2 is the uh, re it reduces the surface state's density of silicon as we have uh, mentioned earlier that basically the surface state's density originating from the unsaturated covalent bonds or the dangling bonds because of the cut of the slice from the mother ingot because uh, that we have discussed earlier that the whole crystal is uh, obtained as the ball crystal which is say uh, 4 inch, 6 inch, 10 inch or even more than 20 inch diameter and length is uh, some quite a, a, a few feet and from where we cut the slice as to use as a wafer or the substrate for the epitaxial growth or for the other kind of IC processing. And uh, the surface state density of silicon it reduces, it can be grown with good control over interface traps and fixed charge to control the leakage current of the junction device and formation of stable gate oxide for field effect devices. So, these are the important properties of silicon dioxide. Now, there are many methods which uh, we use for the oxidation, one is the thermal oxidation, another is the electrochemical anodization, third one is the plasma reaction. And out of this generally in semiconductor planar technology, we use the thermal oxidation. The other two oxidations are not generally used. Now, what happens for gallium arsenide? Now, because we are talking about the silicon and so far as the gallium arsenide is concerned, you see that for gallium arsenide, if we try to oxidize gallium arsenide, what happens? It will be arsenic oxide, it will be gallium oxide as well as the arsine. So, uh, it is obviously, it will be non stoichiometric and so the films if we try to process uh, oxidation out of gallium arsenide surface or on gallium arsenide surface, we will find that there will be non stoichiometric films. And because of the non stoichiometric, poor electrical insulation is there. So, the very spirit of the oxidation layer because it is used as the insulation and uh, between the devices or between the gate ox or, or between the gate oxide and the uh, metal. Uh, so, it will be uh, defeated and also the semiconductor surface protection will be very poor because of the non stoichiometry. So, uh, you see that though, though gallium is very important material because you know that uh, for gallium arsenide, what happens the mobility for gallium arsenide is 9200 centimeter square per volt second if we compare with silicon which is 1450. So, if we compare this 1450 with 9200, we will find that it al almost 6 times higher mobility in gallium arsenide than silicon. So, the mobility is very high and also the breakdown field which is in case of silicon is 3 into 10 to the power 4 in comparison to 5 4 into 10 to the power 4 volt per centimeter. This is for silicon and this is for gallium arsenide. We see that the breakdown field is higher in case of gallium arsenide. So, these are the advantages of gallium arsenide over silicon and uh, the mobility is 6 times higher, the breakdown field is higher. Uh, so, uh, gallium arsenide device or MOS devices can be uh, used for very faster response for power electronics etcetera. But unfortunately, because of the uh, lack of proper oxidation on gallium arsenide like silicon because no native oxide is uh, obtained in case of gallium arsenide and so, uh, it is not used uh, that means, the oxidation of gallium arsenide is not used like the oxidation of silicon, silicon oxide. Now, the uh, obvious reason is obviously, the non stoichiometry and another important thing is that people have tried to form gallium arsenide MOS devices, gallium arsenide uh, MOS devices, metal oxide semiconductor devices with the help of titanium oxide then zirconium oxide, then uh, PZT, also people used SiO2, then gallium oxide, gadolinium oxide, GD3, 
G D 2 O 3. So, these type of uh, various oxides uh, or, or the insulators were used for the fabrication of gallium arsenide moss and the basic structure can be like this say we start with a gallium arsenide substrate suppose it is a p type substrate on which we form a oxide layer say T i O 2 and then there is a metal gate say aluminum over it or gold germanium over it. So, if we take the contact between the two it acts as a parallel plate MOS capacitor and with the uh, T i O 2 as the dielectric between the two plates one plate is this one another plate is this gallium arsenide. And uh, uh, the, if the problem is here is that which, which we encounter is that this interface between the T i O 2 and gallium arsenide needs to be passivated interface needs to be passivated. That means, the interface states or the uh, unwanted energy levels in the band gap that must be passivated using some chemicals and in this case so generally people used hydrogen plasma or sulfur passivation or SiO2 passivation. So, this type of passivation layer is required for the gallium arsenide uh, MOS devices and so that is the advantage of silicon MOS over gallium arsenide that in silicon uh, devices the silicon oxide is the native oxide for gallium arsenide such kind of native oxide is not available. So, for gallium arsenide even if it has many kinds of advantages over silicon because of the non stoichiometric films it is not used. Now, for the oxidation process we need a reactor and in this view graph you see that this is a oxidation reactor and which consists of these are the uh, parts of the reactor it consists of a resistance heated furnace this is the resistance heated furnace and this furnace can be resistance heated, it can be inductance heated, it can be uh, lamp heating like quartz lamp etcetera. So, uh, this is the uh, in this figure it is the resistance heated furnace. Then a cylindrical fused quartz tube containing the silicon wafers held vertically in a slotted quartz board. So, a cylindrical fused quartz, this is a cylindrical fused quartz and this is the slotted quartz board on which the silicon wafers are placed. You see there are a large number of silicon wafers are placed on the quartz board inside the quartz tube. And this uh, source of dry oxygen or pure water vapor is required in this case and this is the pure oxygen or pure water vapor which is carried by some carrier gas like the argon or nitrogen inside the reactor chamber. And so far as the loading front is concerned that means, the, the loading end is, is housed in a vertical flow hood where a filtered flow of air is maintained and you see the direction of the air the filtered air is coming from the top and it is going to the exhaust. So, there will be a laminar flow at the loading end and uh, that means, through which the silicon wafers are put inside the quartz board. And the hood reduces the dust and particulate matters in the air surrounding the wafers and minimizes contamination during wafer loading. Now, what is the uh, implication of the reduction of dust and particulate matters? And, and you, you see that so far as the processing of the semiconductor materials is concerned, it is always done in a clean room. And not only that there will be a hood type of thing which we have described earlier in connection with the oxidation chamber, the whole process unit must be housed in a clean room. And this uh, description of the clean room which I can show you is that uh, there can be different types of clean room. It, it can be class 100, it can be class M 3.5, it can be class 10, it can be class 1000 and we shall discuss those things. Practically a dust particle incorporated into the gate oxide can result in enhanced conductivity 
and cause device failure due to low breakdown voltage. Suppose we want to make a MOS device and we, we have gate oxide, say this is the substrate, then this is the source, then this is the drain and this is the gate. This gate, the, a channel must be formed just below the gate oxide and this gate oxide must be an insulating one. Now, if there is a particulate or some dust inside the oxide, inside the insulating material, then what will ha happen? Suppose SiO2 we would like to grow, it is insulator and uh, almost 11 is the dielectric constant and if we add some dust with it, may be that 11 will reduce to 2 or 3 that means it will be conducting in nature. And since it will be conducting in nature, so the uh, breakdown will be held will, will be will occur before the actual operation of the device. So, it can disrupt the single crystal growth of an epitaxial film causing the formation of dislocation and this problem of incorporation of dust or the particulate matter is very severe for lithographic process. And for lithographic process you see that suppose we want to transfer this pattern and if there is a dust particle, so what will happen that it will be opaque to some photo mask and when it will be exposed then there will be a connection between level, this connection between this feature and this feature. So, there will be a short circuit type of network between these two pattern. Now, be, between these two patterns, since there will be a short circuit type of, of network, so obviously there will be device failure. Or suppose you want to make the thickness of this open space is, is like say x and because of the dust particle, x reduces to x by 4 or x by 3, so there will be device failure. So, because of this type of problem associated with the incorporation of dust particle into the gate oxide or into the lithographic process, we need a clean room type of thing where there will be which, which will be free from any dust particle and particulate matter. Another important aspect of the uh, of this uh, uh, incorporation is that suppose we are growing to uh, we are growing some epitaxial film and there is a, a dust particle on the substrate. So, what will happen? There will be dislocation and so that epitaxial layer will not be used for the growth of the device or the fabrication of the device. Now, because of this uh, uh, difficulties associated with the incorporation of dust particle, we need a clean room and so far as the clean room is concerned, how to define a clean room? There are two systems using which the clean room can be defined. One is the metric system, another is the uh, English system. In English system, generally class is used class 10, class 10,000, class 1,000. This type of method uh, of uh, nomenclature is given and for metric system, class M 3.5, class M 6.5, class M 9, those are used. In English system, maximum allowable number of particles of size 0 0.5 micron and larger per cubic foot. That means, if we take 1 cubic foot of the volume, then within that volume of 1 cubic foot, there should not be 100 particles of size 0 0.5 micron and larger. When we talk about 0 0.5 micron or larger, that means, it is the diameter of the particle. It is the size of the particle means the diameter of the particle. So, it must be very precise that suppose in this room first you calculate the number, first you calculate the volume of this room and then how many dust particles of that size, size means 0 0.5 micron and larger can be accommodated at the maximum. Within that limit it is ok. Otherwise, we have to reduce the dust particles to make it a clean room and obviously, these are not clean room and in class 100 clean room, the dust count must be 100 particles per cubic feet. 
with that size, size means 0.5 micron and larger. Now, in metric system, it is taken as the logarithm base 10 of the maximum allowable number of particles of the same size. The size is constant 0.5 micron and larger in both the cases. In class 100, that means in English system, it is cubic foot is taken as the volume. In metric system, cubic meter is taken as the volume. And suppose we have a class M 3.5. So, what is the value of class M 3.5? say class m 3.5 means 10 to the power 3.5 and approximately it becomes 3500 particles per cubic meter approximately. The value uh, is say uh, 3200 or such. Let us take as 3500, 10 to the power 3.5, these particles per meter cube. Now, class 100 it is basically 100 particles per cubic feet. Now, we know that 1 feet is equals to 0 0.3048 meter. Now, if you take 1 feet cube, then it becomes 0 0.0283 meter cube. And then, if you take the reciprocal of 1 feet cube, then it will be 1 by 1 feet cube is equals to 1 by 0 0.0283 and it will give you 3.53 per meter cube. So, now if you compare with this class 10 and a class 100 and class M 3.5, what you find that in class M 3.5, you have 3500 particles per meter cube class 100, 100 particles per feet cube. If you convert this feet into meter, you will find that it is nothing but 3500 particles per feet cube, meter cube. So, that means, in English system class 100 is equivalent to class M 3.5 in metric system. So, in this manner one can, one can convert the relative number of dust particles per uh, feet cube or meter cube in a clean room. For semiconductor processing technology, generally class 100, class 1000 clean room is absolutely required. In some cases like say lithographic process, even class 10 clean, clean room is advisable, otherwise you will find that there will be network of connections or that can be other type of damages or pattern which is nothing but the opaque in a light system in a photo mask and that will be very detrimental to the device fabrication. Now, <coughs> another important concept uh, uh, consideration of this oxidation chamber is that you see that whole thing is controlled by the microprocessor. Whole thing means first thing is that we have to load the silicon wafers inside the oxidation chamber. Another important thing is the enhancement of the temperature, raising the temperature from the room temperature to the oxidation temperature. And obviously, the temperature cannot be raised very arbitrarily and suddenly, then there will be warping of the or damage of the silicon wafers due to sudden increase in the change, sudden increase in the temperature. So, there, there will be a heat shock to the wafers. So, obviously, this temperature must be increased very linearly, which is nothing but the ramping. So, ramp heating must be associated with this. So, one thing is the loading of the silicon wafers, another thing is the increase of the temperature from the room temperature to the oxidation temperature linearly, that means by the method of ramping and then it must be stable for quite some time. Suppose during the process of oxidation, the temperature of, of the oxidation furnace must be stable and what is the temperature of oxidation, oxidation furnace? The general temperature which is required for the oxidation of silicon is 900 to 1200 degree 
centigrade generally 900 to 1200 degree centigrade temperature is required for the oxidation of silicon. And this whole thing is, is done by the uh, microprocessor that means it is not done by manually microprocessor control system is available to regulate gas flow sequence. Gas flow sequence means first we have to flow the parching gas say nitrogen gas and then oxygen must be transported by some carrier gas say again by argon or nitrogen gas generally argon gas is not used because uh, the purity of argon is not uh, very high compared to nitrogen ideally hydrogen gas can be used but in this case hydrogen is not used and and so the gas sequence that means first you purge the reactor with nitrogen then you send oxygen by some carrier gas then you stop oxygen but you flow the carrier gas you made to flow the carrier gas and then you switch off the carrier gas so that the process is completed and uh, this is nothing but the flow sequence which is regulated by the microprocessor system associated in such kind of a oxidation chamber. To control the automatic insertion and removal of wafers that means you have to load the wafers inside the chamber and at the same time you have to remove the wafer from the chamber that means after the oxidation is over the temperature is come down from say 1000 degree temperature to room temperature and then it can be removed. Then the wafers are oxidized obviously. To ramp the temperature up to, uh, up to the uh, temperature of oxidation, to avoid warping of wafers due to sudden temperature change, to maintain oxidation temperature within plus minus 1 degree centigrade and this is very uh, important aspect because you see that when the temperature is 900 to 1200 degree centigrade, suppose I need 1080 degree centigrade for oxidation and it must be 1080 plus minus 1 degree centigrade. That means very precise control of the oxidation temperature is absolutely required uh, so that the temperature remains stable for quite some time still the operation is completed that means still the all the wafers are oxidized. And then to ramp the temperature down again from the uh, say 1080 to room temperature. So, these are the uh, sequence of events which can be done by a fully microprocessor control system. Now, when we talk about the uh, growth of the oxi of oxide layers, so let us talk about the kinetics of growth. What is kinetics of growth? How the oxidation takes place? The oxidation takes place by the chemical reaction suppose there are silicon and oxygen it will be SiO2 and if we use the water vapor then obviously there will be SiO2 plus hydrogen. So, these are the reactions the first one is uh, due to the dry oxidation and the second one is due to the wet oxidation where the water vapor is required. Now, this is the uh, kinetics of growth or, or the reaction is like this and you see that silicon silicon dioxide interface moves into the silicon during oxidation. That means, say this is the dotted line of the original silicon surface and this gray area that means this is the oxide layers which is moving inside the silicon during oxidation. That means oxidation should take place uh, with the reaction of the silicon and the oxygen or the water vapor and in the process silicon is consumed and I shall show you that uh, 40 per 44 percent silicon is consumed for the preparation of SiO2 out of silicon. So, that means suppose you start from an oxidation this is your silicon first the silicon dioxide is formed at the surface layer then this silicon dioxide layer moves inside the silicon wafer from the surface inside its to its bulk. So, that means some silicon is consumed because that is the condition of the reaction that you need silicon you need silicon. 
<coughs> now, let us talk about the uh, uh, quantification of the silicon dioxide form. Let us uh, solve a very small numerical to uh, forward this point. If a silicon dioxide layer of thickness x is grown by thermal oxidation, what is the thickness of silicon being consumed? If a silicon dioxide layer of thickness x is grown by thermal oxidation, suppose I want uh, uh, a silicon oxide layer of 100 nanometer. So, if I want 100 nanometer, then what is the thickness of silicon being consumed? Because I have a wafer of say 300 micron or 400 micron or 200 micron thick and uh, I want 100 nanometer of the uh, silicon dioxide layer on the surface of the silicon wafer, then how much silicon wafer is consumed? And the values are given that the molecular weight of silicon is 28.9 gram per mole and the density of silicon is 2.33 gram per centimeter cube, it is given and the corresponding values that means the molecular weight of silicon dioxide is 28.9 gram per mole and the density of silicon is 2 is, is uh, 2.21 gram per centimeter cube. So, let us uh, try to solve this numerical, first thing is that given molecular weight of silicon, molecular weight of silicon it is 28.9 gram per mole and molecular weight of silicon dioxide it is also given it is 60.08 gram per mole. And another parameter is given that is the density, density of silicon is given it is uh, 2.33 gram per centimeter cube and that of density of SiO2 it is 2.21 gram per centimeter cube. So, these four values are given and we shall try to calculate how much silicon is consumed for the growth of x thickness of SiO2 or say 100 nanometer of SiO2. Now, what is the process? The process is very simple. Let us try to calculate the volume. One, uh, the volume of one mole of silicon. First, we shall calculate the volume of one mole of silicon and then we shall calculate the volume of one mole of silicon dioxide. Now, how this is calculated? It is calculated by very simple relation. It is the molecular weight of silicon by density of silicon. What is the molecular weight of silicon? It is 28.9 gram per mole it is given and density of silicon it is 2.33 gram per centimeter cube it is also given and if we simplify it, it will be 12.06 centimeter cube per mole. So, this is the volume of one mole of silicon. Now, let us calculate the volume of one mole of silicon dioxide, then volume of 1 mole of silicon dioxide SiO2. We shall use the same formula only in place of silicon we shall use the values for SiO2 that means molecular weight of SiO2 by density of SiO2. What is the molecular of SiO2? It is given as 60.08 gram per mole and the density of SiO2 is 2.21 gram per centimeter cube. So, with simplification it becomes 27.18 centimeter cube by mole. Okay. So, then the next question is how we shall proceed? One 
mole of silicon is converted to 1 mole of SiO2. So, that means thickness of Si into area by thickness of SiO2 into area, this is equals to volume of 1 mole of silicon by volume of 1 mole of SiO2. Then suppose the thickness of silicon is x, suppose the thickness of silicon is x and the thickness of SiO2, suppose the thickness of uh, SiO2 is x because that is given and the thickness of silicon we would like to calculate. So, this is thickness of silicon, this is equals to volume of 1 mole of silicon we have calculated it is 12.06 by volume of 1 mole of SiO2, it is 27.18 and it becomes 0 0.44. That means, we can write thickness of silicon is equals to 0 0.44 x that means, thickness of SiO2. Okay. So, now if we want to grow 100 nanometer of SiO2, the thickness of silicon becomes 44 nanometer, 44 nanometer. So, that means 44 percent of the silicon is consumed in the process of SiO2. So, uh, first what will happen? Some silicon will react with the oxygen or the water vapor to form SiO2 layer that will be governed by the surface reaction and as, as the silicon dioxide is formed, it will try to penetrate or diffuse because uh, otherwise the uh, oxidation oxidizing species will not be able to react with silicon because silicon is there underneath the SiO2 layer. So, the oxidizing species must be diffused through the SiO2 layer. Uh, to react with SI. So, that means some part of the SI will be consumed and the SiO2 layer will be uh, will be moving towards the bulk of the SI. That means, this is moving bulk you see this is the dotted line and it is the boundary of the uh, silicon substrate before oxidation starts and after the oxidation is over you see that the SiO2 layer which is this gray layer, it is, go, it is going down the dotted line towards the bulk that means, it is the moving. So, that is why I have written that silicon silicon dioxide interface moves into the silicon during oxidation. So, that means, we have seen that uh, 44 percent of the uh, silicon is consumed in the process. Now, what is the structure of SiO2? What is the structure of SiO2? You see that uh, the structure is very important because not necessarily that SiO2 will be uh, always crystalline or always amorphous. Normally, the uh, thermal oxidation uh, SiO2 grown by thermal oxidation are amorphous in nature, but apart from the uh, oxidation uh, apart from the crystalline amorphous nature, there are crystalline structures which are known as the quartz because SiO2 you know that it is known as the silica in some cases and quartz is a form of silica which is crystalline in nature. Now, let us uh, talk about the SiO2 structure. A silicon atom you see that surrounded tetrahedrally by 4 oxygen atoms. So, this is silicon atom and 4 oxygen atoms are surrounded tetrahedrically and uh, this is a tetrahedron structure and the internuclear distance between oxygen and silicon is 1.6 angstrom while the internuclear distance between oxygen and oxygen is 2.27 angstrom. Here also it is 2.27 angstrom. So, 
this is the uh, tetrahedron structure of a silicon atom surrounded by 4 oxygen atom it is 1 unit. These tetrahedra are joined together at their corners by oxygen bridges in a number of ways to form the various phases of or structures of silicon dioxide. These tetrahedra are joined together at their corners by oxygen bridges in a number of ways to form the various phases or structures of silicon dioxide. Now, depending on the structure that means the oxygen bridges and it can be amorphous, it can be crystalline in nature and two types of structures I shall show you. One is the crystalline or the quartz, another is the amorphous structure and in this crystalline structure you see that these are the rings. Uh, this is the one thing is that it is a long molecular structure, periodic structure and made up of rings with 6 silicon atoms you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Here you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 silicon atoms are there and they form a ring, one ring, second ring, third ring, fourth ring and so on and so on. There will be a large number of rings and all the rings you see that made up of rings with 6 silicon atoms and the density is 2.65 gram per centimeter cube. Now, if you compare this structure with this uh, amorphous one, you see that almost there is no periodicity in this structure if you compare these two structure and the density is 2.21 gram per centimeter cube. So, obviously, uh, the crystalline structure is more dense or denser than the amorphous structure. So, it means that the amorphous structure there must be some sporosity and you see that uh, only 43 percent space is occupied by SiO2 molecules that means there are empty spaces and only 43 percent uh, of the space is occupied by SiO2 molecules. So, that means there are a large number of pores inside the uh, structure and so the diffusion of the impurity is possible. And another thing is that there is a tendency to form characteristics ring, but not with the 6 silicon atom. Here the black dots are the silicon atom. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 here you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but here you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, here you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, here you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, though there is a tendency to form characteristics ring but uh, this is uh, very haphazard in manner and so it is amorphous in nature. So, basically the building block is the tetrahedron where the silicon is uh, seated at the center with 4 oxygen atoms tetrahedrically and this is one unit which is repeated here because of the bridging by oxygen. And depending on the formation of the rings, one is crystalline, this is one form of crystalline and another is amorphous nature. And in our discussion and since we are, are growing SiO2 with thermal oxidation, that thermal oxidation gives you the uh, amorphous nature and that is why it there is a tendency that uh, diffusion or impurity can penetrate through SiO2 layer in this case. And now, if we uh, consider the uh, growth model, you see that oxide thickness after oxidizing time t is given by this relation. So, uh, this is available from any standard textbook you find and uh, th the constants, there are some constants say d is the diffusion coefficient of the oxidizing species, k is the surface reaction rate constant, then C0 is the surface concentration of oxidizing species and uh, tau is represents a time coordinate shift to account for the initial oxide layer and uh, this C1, C1 uh, is another uh, uh, surface concentration of oxidizing species. Its value is 2.2 10 to the power 22 for dry oxygen and if you use the weight oxidation for weight oxidation, its value will be 2.2 into 10 to the power 22 multiplied by 2 centimeter cube inverse. Why? For dry oxidation, 
it is 2.2 into 10 to the power 22. Why that is a factor of 2 to be multiplied with this one? It is because you see that for dry oxidation, oxygen molecule is used where there are two atoms of oxygen. For wet oxidation, water vapor is used where there is only one oxygen. So, there must be two water vapors to complete the reaction and so that means it must be multiplied by 2. So, the value of C 1 will be different for different uh, methods of oxidation be it dry or wet and you see that with this uh, uh, thickness with this thickness of the uh, oxide layer there are two terms which I shall define one is the parabolic rate constant another is the uh, linear rate constant. This is uh, the reaction gives you the oxide thickness of x equals to something and for small t for small t you see that x will be equals to twice uh, sorry uh, x will be equals to c 0 k c 1 t plus tau that is for small t and for large t for large t x will be root over of twice d c 0 by c 1 t plus tau. Okay. So, this is nothing but the uh, simplification of this thickness oxide thickness for larger t and smaller t. For smaller t you see that it is the that can that expression can be simplified to this one for larger t that expression can be simplified to this thing and from here x can be written as this x can be written as b by a t plus tau where b by a is given by k c 0 by c 1 that means this is b by a. So, this is uh, this can be simplified to x equals to b by a t plus tau and for larger t this expression can be simplified to x equals to uh, sorry x square equals to b t plus tau where b is given by where b is given by twice d c 0 by c 1 this is b and this is b by a. So, so what we see that here it is the linear thing and here it is the parabolic thing. So, we can say that b by a is referred to as the linear rate constant and this b is known as the parabolic rate constant. This is parabolic rate constant and this is linear rate constant because this is the expression for a parabola and this is the expression for a linear variation. So, we can conclude that during the early stages of oxide growth when surface reaction is the rate limiting factor surface reaction that means the rate of formation of oxidation is due to the surface reaction and in that case the oxide thickness varies linearly with time that means x equals to b by a t plus tau this b by a is the linear rate constant it is due to the surface reaction. But as the oxide layer becomes thicker the oxidant mass diffuse through the oxide layer to react at the silicon silicon dioxide interface and the reaction becomes diffusion limited. The oxide growth then becomes proportional to the square root of the oxidizing time which results in a parabolic growth rate that is why you see that it is x square equals to b into t by tau that is the parabolic growth rate. So, with this we conclude today that the oxidation for the initial stage it is the linear variation. So, b by a is known as the linear rate constant and as the reaction starts and it it's continues then it becomes parabolic in nature due to the diffusion of the oxidizing species inside the SiO2 towards the SI surface. Thank you.